Welcome to the Courageous Conversations podcast, hosted by me, Hannah Chadwick, the director and founder of Fortitude Training. In each episode, I'll be sharing my tales, tips, and techniques with the hope that they'll help you make your work life more positive and productive. I hope you're able to find the hidden gems that you can learn from and utilize to positively impact both your personal and professional life. Each week, you'll hear about a variety of topics like workplace culture, well-being, diversity, leadership, and team building. Episodes will be a mixture of me sharing stories from my own personal and professional experience and me interviewing guests where they're sharing their lived experience insights. I hope you're able to find the hidden gems that you can utilize to positively impact your personal and professional life. Hello and welcome to the brand new Courageous Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Chadwick from Fortitude Training. Firstly, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in today. If you haven't already done so, please remember to subscribe so that you'll always know when I upload. And whilst you're there, why not leave a rating and review? I promise to read them all and as a new show, it really helps to have the feedback from the listeners So if you could spare a few moments to add a review or a rating, I'd really appreciate it. So happy Friday, everyone, and Eid Mubarak to those of you who are celebrating Eid al-Adha. We've made it to the end of the work week and to the end of July, and let's hope that August has an abundance of good weather and good energy in store for us, because we sure need it right now. And as today is the 31st of July, I'd like to give a special shout out to my husband, as today is our 11th wedding anniversary. Thank you for always loving and supporting me through this journey that we call life. I'm blessed to be able to travel this road with you and here's to many more years of joy and happiness ahead. Now, without further ado, let's get into today's show. We'll be starting off with The Rundown, which features some of the positive news stories from this past week. Then we'll get into The Courageous Conversation, which today asks the question, is your organisation epic when it comes to meeting your employees' wellness needs? Then we'll have this week's Hero of the Week. And finally, I'll lead us out on a positive note. Grab yourself a cup of tea or a cold drink, because we're about to get started. This is The Rundown. So, the 2020 Emmy nominations have been announced, and there's a plethora of talented individuals from diverse backgrounds featured in the list. It's beautiful to see, and it's well-deserved. We've seen names like Cicely Tyson, Regina King, Rami Youssef, Sandra Oh and Octavia Spencer to name but a few. Hopefully this marked improvement in diversity of nominees is a sign of things to come in the acting world. Secondly, we've bid a fond farewell to the beloved civil rights activist John Lewis, whose homegoing service took place this week. The documentary about his life, John Lewis, Good Trouble, is currently available on major streaming platforms and I'd strongly recommend that you give it a watch. And finally, restrictions are going to be coming into place on unhealthy food advertising, with no pre-watershed advertising of junk food and compulsory calorie counts being introduced on restaurant menus in an effort to tackle the obesity crisis. Now it's time for today's Courageous Conversation. Is your organisation epic when it comes to meeting your employees' wellness needs? EPIC is an acronym that I've come up with to represent the key areas of employee well-being that I feel you need to be supporting your teams in. And I'll be providing you with examples of ways that you can try to meet those needs. The areas are emotional needs, physical needs, intellectual needs and collective needs. One of the few benefits of this pandemic is that more attention is being paid to employee well-being and the duty of care owed by employers to their employees. So you're probably wondering, why does this even matter to me? Well, I know firsthand what it feels like to have those needs inadvertently, or sometimes even intentionally, overlooked. I've therefore experienced the impact that it's had on myself, and some of those I've worked with. I've also observed and experienced organisations who are committed to getting these things right. I want to help you and your organisation to join the ranks of the latter, and not the former. So let's get started with EPIC. The first point is emotional needs. Your employees need to feel able to express themselves freely. They need to know that their thoughts and feelings will be listened to and acted upon rather than ignored or denied. 
I've experienced varying degrees of what is essentially gaslighting during my working career, where I've either been made to feel like I was making things up that we all knew to be true, or I've been manipulated into thinking that I was the problem. Fortunately for me, in the first instance, I had a catalogue of evidence to support my claims. And in the latter, when I spoke to my fellow colleagues about my concerns, it turned out that they were being treated the exact same way and were being fed the same lines as me. More serious instances of failures to meet employees' emotional needs can cause damage to the employee's mental and physical health, which could ultimately land the employer with either a tribunal claim or even a personal injury claim for damage caused to psychological health. Good examples I've seen in my career come in the form of having open channels of communication between employees and management. In particular, whilst I was working as an apprenticeship trainer, one of the organisations I worked closely with had a dedicated pastoral care team, guiding, nurturing and supporting the welfare of their apprentices. I don't think that that type of support should be limited to young people. Most of my apprentices were aged 16 to 24. All employees would stand to benefit from having that intermediary within the workplace. Someone who has dedicated time to spend catering to employee well-being in a way that line managers and HR teams often can't do, simply due to their wider responsibilities. Next up, we have physical needs. It's vital that organisations ensure their employees are taking their appropriate and legally required breaks and downtime. In certain sectors, like the legal sector, where I worked for most of my career, there's an unwritten expectation that you deliver no matter what the cost. I've been that person, working through my lunch, afraid to even get a cup of tea or to go to the toilet, and staying late or coming in even at the weekends. Did I ever get a thank you? No. Did I ever get overtime paid for all the extra hours I worked? I've only ever made one claim for overtime for about three hours worth of work in my entire working career. And I've definitely worked hundreds more hours of unpaid overtime over the span of my working life. The approach to sticking to working hours has to be assessed, particularly by those notoriously guilty sectors. In contrast, I remember when I worked in the insolvency arm of a national debt advice charity. I'd eaten my lunch in about 10 minutes and couldn't be bothered wandering into town and spending £20 in home bargains on impulse buys that I didn't really need. Hey, we've all been there. So, I returned to the office, sat down at my desk, and cracked on with my work. My boss told me off in the nicest way possible. She said that I shouldn't be working through my lunch, and despite my protest that I didn't mind and just wanted to be productive and help out to get the work cleared, she sent me packing. I remember being confused as this was just the expectation in some of the places I'd worked. In fact, you'd be more likely to get pulled up for having taken a break than for not doing so. I eventually understood, and when I became a manager myself some years later, I was sure to instil this message in my direct reports. I'd tell them, at the end of the day, you're not going to get paid for the time that you're giving, and nobody's going to say thank you but me. The same applies when it comes to annual leave. If the people in your organisation have heaps of holiday left over at the end of your holiday year, chances are they don't feel like they have time to be able to take time off because their workload is probably too high or maybe they're experiencing some other problems such as presenteeism where they're unable to effectively manage their responsibilities. I've worked in an organisation where people, myself included, routinely worked despite being on quote-unquote holiday. This was partly because of the ridiculous workload and partly because there was a lack of accountability with some of the support teams, meaning that essentially you always felt you had to be on to fix their errors or omissions. This was on top of already working 10 to 12 hour working days and often working over the weekends too, without paid overtime I must add. The lack of proper rest meant that myself and my colleagues were always sick, but often still continued working. At the lower end of the scale, I've worked through flu and eventually collapsed on my bathroom tiles and I still have a nice scar on my face as a reminder of that incident. At the more severe end of the scale, I suffered a nervous breakdown and tried to end my life. And then a few weeks later, I suffered an early miscarriage. I told my employer about both situations and didn't really receive appropriate support or help. And needless to say, 
I kept on working throughout both. On a lighter note, employees' physical needs could also be supported through things like exercise. This could take various forms in the workplace, from walking meetings, to starting a walking or running club at lunchtime, or even workplace yoga that has benefits such as combating stress and increasing productivity. One of my connections, the lovely Ella from Business Yoga, provides workshops and she's even doing them remotely due to lockdown. If you're interested, check her out at businessyoga.co.uk. Next up, we have intellectual needs. Employees need to be provided with opportunities to expand their knowledge, skills and creativity. They should be given the chance to increase their skill set. This could mean shadowing you or another colleague, deepening their understanding of their current role or learning about other areas of the business. I've worked in places where they just wanted staff to process data, follow processes and not think for themselves. Not only does that not get the best out of people, because who wants to be a robot? It also stifles their creative thinking and problem solving skills. So when a situation would arise that didn't neatly fit into a predefined process, the cracks started to show and errors would result. When I was a manager, I had a mixture of staff on my team. Some of them were happy with the -the run-of-the-mill, predictable, process-driven work. Others hungered for more and wanted something to get their teeth into and to progress within the organisation. I enjoyed delegating tasks to them and giving them additional duties to get their creative juices flowing. My staff were at their happiest and performed at their best when they were given the chance to learn, grow and shine. Finally, we have collective needs. If lockdown has taught us anything, it's that we're social beings and it can feel very counterintuitive to be unable to socialise and interact as we normally would. There have to be social aspects at work in order for employees to thrive. I'm not just talking about the traditional Friday night drinks that can actually feel quite excluding for many. I'm a mum, so I could never go to the after work drinks. I had to get home to take over the childcare from my husband so he could go back to work. Likewise, after work drinks also exclude non-drinkers, whether it's for personal or religious reasons. In contrast, my team would go for a weekly team lunch. We all have to eat after all. Collective needs can be incorporated into your organisation's CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility Commitments. And this could take various forms. It could be supporting local projects in the community, like a homeless shelter or charity. You could partner with a local school and get staff to listen to the children reading or host an after-school club or session, teaching them about your industry. My daughter used to attend a fantastic STEM club at her school where she did experiments and fun activities. You could even do a fundraiser, like a walking or cycling challenge, and some team building exercises. Whatever you decide to do, providing that communal downtime away from the business as usual tasks doesn't just give your team the chance to relax. It provides an opportunity to get to know their wider teammates and to feel part of the community that is your organisation. Your team members are like the patches in the quilt that forms your organisation and meeting their collective needs could be the thread that your organisation needs to bring them all together. That was this week's Courageous Conversation, and now it's time for Hero of the Week. The first ever Hero of the Week goes to former police officer, Cariel Horn. On the 25th of May this year, it felt like the entire world stood together, unified in disgust and outrage at the brutal and senseless murder of George Floyd. Whether you watched the video or saw the still images, we all watched in disbelief as police officer Derek Chauvin knelt on Floyd's neck with his hands in his pockets for 8 minutes and 46 seconds. The timestamp has become engraved in the collective consciousness of people the world over. But whilst Derek Chauvin mercilessly squeezed the life out of George Floyd, his three fellow officers assisted him, pinning Floyd's motionless body to the ground. The entire world seemed to be asking themselves, how could these officers co-sign to this inhumane behaviour they saw being perpetuated against a man who was being pursued over a possibly fake $20 bill? So today I want to tell you a story about what happened to an officer who did do the right thing in very similar circumstances. Cariel Horn is a former Buffalo Police Department officer who got fired for doing the right thing. 
the very thing that we all wish Derek Chauvin's colleagues had done. In 2006, Horn received and responded to an officer in trouble call. On arrival, she found the 59-year-old suspect, Neil Mack, was handcuffed and according to Horn, the suspect was being punched in the face by her police officer colleague. On vacating the premises with the suspect, Horn alleges that her colleague swung the suspect around, then crouched down and choked him, more commonly known as a chokehold. Nearly a dozen police officers were at the scene, but only Horn intervened, pleading with her colleague to stop. When he failed to do so, Horn removed the officer's arm from around the suspect's neck. In response, Horn alleges that the officer punched her in the face, which resulted in her needing her bridge replacing. She still suffers migraines over a decade later. Following the incident, Horn, who had served as a police officer for 18 years, was charged with obstruction for stopping the officer. She was eventually fired and never received her police pension. In contrast, the officer responsible was promoted. He later faced accusations of choking another police officer and was eventually subject to federal civil rights charges, which he pled guilty to and served a custodial sentence for. He was allowed to keep his police pension. Horn had hoped that the charges against the officer would have vindicated her, but that wasn't the case. Over the years, she claims that her and her family have been subjected to harassment at the hands of the police. She was even sued by the police officer in question for defamation of character. She lost her home, her car, and to date, she still hasn't been awarded her police pension. Because of what Horn did, Neil Mack didn't become the precursor to George Floyd. When asked during a recent interview whether the decision she made was worth everything she lost, Horn replied, it was worth him living. Cariel is currently petitioning for Cariel's law. That would introduce protection from retaliation for police officers and would place them under a duty to intervene where police officers pose an imminent threat to citizens. And it would also create accountability for officers who fail to intervene. She also has a GoFundMe page under her name, which currently has over $164,000. Cariel Horn, you're my hero of the week. Well, we've almost reached the end of the show and I hope you've all enjoyed the first episode and that you've learned something useful. Every week I'm going to send us out on a positive note, which is simply a quote or a saying that I've chosen to share with you. This week's is one that sums up why I started my business and it's from Mahatma Gandhi. And it's simply this, be the change that you wish to see in the world. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Courageous Conversations podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to access your podcasts. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. Don't forget to tune into next week's episode. And until then, take care. Bye for now.